It's nice to be here at long, long last. Uh, no thanks to GigaClear, who have uh, not been able to supply our internet or phone for the last five days and don't seem to know why. Um, it's a bit of a shambles anyway. We're here and I'm, we may drop off because I'm actually trying to do this through my iPhone. However, we'll do our best. Um, my name is, for those of you who don't know me, is uh, Dr. Malcolm Savage, qualified in uh, medicine in St. Mary's, London in 1988. And I was basically, I've been an anaesthetist since, was an anaesthetist from 1990 to 2015, spending the last 15 years of my career in Gloucester Royal Hospital. Right, so anaesthetics, um, huge subject covering 170 years. So this can be no more, unfortunately, than a whistle-stop tour of the subject. Um, like all great, uh, let's just start with some definitions, first of all. Some of the more uh, flippant ones, perhaps to start with. 99% uh, sheer boredom, 1% absolute panic. That's the way it's described by a lot of our other medical colleagues. Um, most anaesthetists would say it's a half asleep observing the half awake while they're being half murdered by the half witted. And as a very senior colleague put it to me many, many years ago, when I first started in anaesthetics, you're doing your level best to keep the patient alive but asleep, while some lunatic with a knife and scissors is doing their utmost to kill them. However, um, more uh, germane to the issue, um, Pharmac the, the, well, the definition of anaesthesia, of course, is the loss of sensation from the Greek word anaesthesia, sensation or sen sensate um, knowledge. I prefer to describe it as the pharmacological manipulation <clears throat> of physiological parameters to produce a state in the patient of unawareness, analgesia and relaxation. So when did it all start? Um, hmm. Well, arguably the first anaesthetic given to a man was by God, Book of Genesis. The word anaesthetic, by the way, first coined by Oliver Wendell Hope, school in Boston in 1850-something, but also found in um, Bailey's Oxford Dictionary of 1751. So anyway, Book of Genesis records that God made the man fall into a deep sleep and while he slept he took one of his ribs and enclosed it in flesh. Hmm. However, probably a little bit more practically, uh, nitrous oxide, laughing gas, first discovered by Joseph Priestley. Uh, however, Humphrey Davy described its properties um, by inhaling it, produced a state of elation and insensibility to pain, but sadly did nothing more about it from there. It wasn't until 1844 that a Connecticut dentist called Horace Wells, a colourful character, um, was watching a demonstration at a fairground given by a man called Gardner Q. Colton, who described himself as a travelling lecturer in chemistry. And he was um, showing the state of elation produced by nitrous oxide to a crowd of volunteers in a fairground. And Horace Wells happened just to notice that uh, one of the volunteers uh, hit his shin to the point made it bleed, but afterwards was completely unaware that this had happened and certainly felt no pain. So like many great discoveries, it really happened by accident. <clears throat> so Horace Wells thought about this for a bit and then um, got uh, Gardner Q. Colton to give him some nitrous oxide and got a colleague to pull a tooth out and he felt no pain, was unconscious. And he, de he described this as a new era in tooth pulling. Anyway, he then went about his dental business, pulling people's teeth out under, under a nitrous oxide, probably more by asphyxia than anesthesia because there was a lack of oxygen. Um, he administered it via an animal bladder connected to a wooden tube. And after he'd anesthetized 15 patients, he took his uh, discovery to um, the medical school at Harvard in Boston and demonstrated it to a group of medical students, which was probably a bad idea in the first place. However, the upshot was that uh, it failed miserably with a patient complaining and kicking and screaming all the way through the demonstration. And poor old Horace Wells was booed and hissed out of the, um, out of the arena. He went on basically then to carry on giving anaesthetics in New York became a chloroform addict 
and ended his days um, performing with a troupe of performing canaries in a, in a circus until he committed suicide by cutting his femoral artery at the age of 33. However, the person that was overseeing the um, demonstration in Harvard was a surgeon um, called Crawford Long. And um, sorry, no Crawford, uh, John uh, Warren. And John Warren persuaded another colleague called William Morton to give a patient ether. Morton, by the way, been working on the idea of ether. Morton was a medical student at uh, Boston. And it being proposed that ether could be used as a topical anesthetic for dentistry. So you actually dab the gum with ether, numb it. Um, Morton started to look at ether more seriously and started to anesthetize dogs with it and found it worked very well. So together, Warren and Morton um, performed an operation on the 16th of October in 1846, where Warren removed the, um, a tumour from the jaw of um, one Gilbert Abbott, a journalist, under ether anaesthetic. We can see here the picture. Um, the thing was performed in the operating theatre in Massachusetts General Hospital. Observe to the right the figure, I think, of Aeschylus. Um, I visited the, as it became known, the ether dome in Boston some years ago, and there it is, and there's Aeschylus over in the corner, so things haven't changed very much. So it was, you can see, a proper theatre. Right, so moving on from there, it came very quickly across the Atlantic, and the first anaesthetic was given just some couple of months later, um, as long as it took a steam packet to travel from Boston to Liverpool, Miss Lonsdale, who had an infected tooth removed under ether by Mr. James Robertson in this house in Gower Street in London. This was observed by Robert Liston, the professor of surgery at the University College Hospital this down the road. And um, he was so impressed with the demonstration that he agreed to the 21st of December under ether at University College Hospital. The anaesthetist in this case was a 21 year old medical student. At the, at the end of the operation, the Robert Liston turned his adulating crowd in his operating theatre and announced that this Yankee Dodge um, left mesmerism standing. So there we are. Uh, so ether became the, uh, the stuff to use. Everybody was using ether, apart from in Scotland, of course, where James Simpson, the professor of uh, midwifery, experimented with chloroform and used it for labor pains, and then gradually um, popularized the use of chloroform in Scotland and wrote several papers on the subject. He advocated chloroform over ether because its action was more rapid. It required a smaller quantity to get the same effect. It was more pleasant to inhale, and being a true Scotsman, excuse us, uh, apologies to Andy, it was cheaper. So there we are. So what are we left with? We've got diethyl ether, which was first described by Valerius Cordus in 1515 to 1544 as a sweet oil of vitriol, or sometimes known as um, sulfonic ether, because it's, um, it's made by refluxing sulfonic, sulfuric acid with, uh, with alcohol. It's uh, highly volatile and flammable in air, explosive in oxygen, which is not a good thing. A saturated vapor pressure of 425 millimeters of mercury, so very volatile. Pungent, causes a lot of secretions from mucus producing glands. The patients tend to cough a lot and uh, tend to be very sort of chesty afterwards. But it is very safe because the patient stops breathing before their heart stops, unlike chloroform. It tends to be very emetic, patients are often sick. It's difficult and unpleasant to go to sleep by. It's very irritant to the airways, and anybody of my um, vintage will probably recognize from the smell of hospitals when they were much younger uh, the smell of ether and stale cabbage that permeated the corridors of old Victorian infirmaries. 
Now, another agent that was uh, used at that time was ethyl chloride, which is monochloro um, ethylene or ethane, sorry. sorry. Um, this was first popularized by a Frenchman, Marie Jean Fleur, in Paris. And he was using it as a local uh, anesthetic, in the same way that ether was first of all prescribed. That you, if, you, if you put the stuff on the skin, it, it vaporizes so rapidly that the latent heat of vaporization causes the skin to become very, very cold. And then you can then operate, you can then cut it open and remove things and what have you. But he found that when using it on the face or the neck, quite a lot of his patients actually went unconscious. So realized it was a very good general anesthetic. So it was used for, for the first four decades of the 20th century because it's sweet odor, pleasant to breathe and rapid induction. Nitrous oxide I mentioned, um, first described by Priestley, Davy in 1799 described its properties, Colton, USA Dentistry, Horace Wells we've covered. And then used again, had a bit of a resurgence in London with Messrs Clover and Hewitt, uh, two anaesthetists of the 19th century. But chloroform seems to be the drug of choice. Chloroform seems to be the Victorians' favourite anaesthetic. First described arguably by Moldenhauer in Frankfurt in 1830, used first of all by Samuel Guthrie in New York, choleric ether it's called, first noted anaesthetic property in rats. Um, here we have Clover I mentioned, anaesthetizing his father with chloroform. Um, he's got a large bag over his shoulder, you'll see, containing 4.5% chloroform in air. Um, problem, the big problem with anaesthetics, of course, was there weren't any cylinders in those days. So no cylinders did make life difficult. So you had to cut the stuff around with you. Chloroform towards the end of his career went back to ether. And on the left is his clothes patented ether machine. Anyway, back to chloroform, again, also described von that used at Guthrie, Florence and Paris, I mentioned, for the ethyl chloride, but in St. Bart's, a chap, Coote, popularised it in England, and Simpson, of course, I mentioned in Edinburgh. Now, the first professional anaesthetist in this country was John Snow, who was a sort of a bit of a polymath, really. He was a general practitioner and an epidemiologist who'd gone there very well in these days. Um, he first used ether and then went over to chloroform, gave over 4,000 anaesthetics without episode, giving 4% in air. But he did report cardiac dysrhythmias. However, he had the privilege of administering it to Queen Victoria in childbirth on two occasions uh, by um, dripping it onto a silk handkerchief um, and administering it to Her Majesty. And it became known as chloroform a la reine wrote books and treaties on the subject. Um, it's sweet smelling, and pleasant to breathe, and has a saturated vapor point of much lower than ether, 160 millimeters of mercury. However, it does cause cardiac depression, which gets worse with increased depth of anesthesia, and dysrhythmias are likely to occur, so the heart of arrhythmias occur at light planes of anesthesia. It's toxic to the liver, potentially lethal as well because of this facility of causing heart rhythm um, misadventure. And it's first, the first anaesthetic death was recorded in Newcastle in 1848 with a young girl called Hannah Greener. There again administration difficulties because it's a liquid and you're trying to turn it into a vapor and trying to get the patient to breathe the vapor. This is overcome by a German described uh, technique called the Schimmelbusch mask, which is simply a wire, a wire trap over which you can place um, gauze and drip the stuff onto the gauze. Um, so there's a need for accuracy, uh, accurate delivery of the stuff. The first seamless hand forged cylinders arrived in 1880 by the Bryn brothers, who they later became British Oxygen Company, with distilled oxygen made from air. Um, this made the yeah, transport of anaesthetic gases under pressure a possibility which is good and happens today. So the first anaesthetic, oh, there's the Schimmelbusch mask. Um, he was a pathologist and surgeon, um, Ether, Berlin, 1890, but it was used in part, particularly parts of uh, deep state New York and Washington. 
um, in the States, sort of upriver, um, even into the 1950s. It's a wire cage, as you can see, with which you can stretch lint. The ether has dropped onto it. The important thing is for the ether, liquid ether, not to touch the face because it will burn. Um, and there's the first anaesthetic machine described by uh, Dr. Henry Boyle from Bart's Hospital. It's simply a trolley with cylinders. Um, a flow, interesting flow meter gadget, which I think came is from the spirit lamp. I think somehow they didn't have flow meters. So by turning up the gas, it bubbled through the spirit lamp. And the more bubbles, the more flow, obviously. And then you bubbled it through ether, and then you delivered it through this gadget here via the bag to the patient. The primitive um, anaesthetic machine, 1917. Now, we'll leave general anaesthesia for a while because it's also local and regional anaesthesia. The difference being local anaesthesia is topical, so you put it onto a mucous membrane. Um, substance was cocaine, which is an ester of benzoic acid derived from erythroxylum coca. You can see the ester group in the middle the molecule. Carl Kohler, Vienna, an ophthalmologist, uh, worked with Sigmund Freud in, uh, and discovered the numbing effects on the mucous membranes, in this case, the conjunctiva of the eye. Freud later actually became a cocaine addict. And then Spinal anesthesia became um, a new idea in the end of the century. Uh, Henrik Quink performed the first lumbar puncture in 1891 in Kiel. That's simply putting a needle into the back between the spinous processes and tapping the going through the dura and tapping the central spy, the cerebral spinal fluid, which runs around the brain and spinal cord. Henrik Braun, also in Leipzig, uh, um, sorry, August, Augustus Beer. Um, also in Kiel, uh, then one step further, and instead of just drawing fluid out, injected local anaesthetic in and found that he got numbness from that level downwards, which was temporary, fortunately. Um, Braun in Leipzig um, in 1905 pioneered the use of procaine, which is another uh, ester uh, local anaesthetic, and this idea of nerve blocks of actually induce, introducing the local anaesthetic near a, either a plexus of nerves or um, a ganglion and, and um, blocking nerves that way. And then the epidurals we hear about today in childbirth and used in major surgery. <clears throat> there were experiments done by Catherine and Sicard in Paris as early as 1901, uh, Pages in Madrid and Dogliotti in Turin. But nothing really came of it until much later, probably the 1950s. Now, the trouble with all the esteratic local anaesthetics is they have a very narrow um, therapeutic window. So either they not enough dose to get an effect or too much and it becomes toxic. And they're also very, very short acting. So they were limited in their effect. So that's sort of the introduction really to local anaesthesia. So progress during the 20th century, this was a great period of uh, development. Um, Guidel, Guidel at the airway, which looks like a bit like a dummy, um, which we all know, this was introduced by Arthur Guidel, uh, an anaesthetist in Indianapolis and Los Angeles. He also described very importantly the four levels and stages of anesthesia by the physical signs of pupil diameter and breathing. Um, and he again had his own anaesthetic machine, which he called the old grey mare cabinet anaesthetic machine. Um, but a major development was in 1935 in the therapeutic line uh, with the introduction of thiopental sodium by John Lundy, known as pentothal. And it's a thiobarbiturate. Now, the molecules I've got just a little bit lower down here. On the right is pentobarbitone. Um, you can see on the what, three, four, fourth um, carbon moiety, there are one, two, three, four, five carbon, it's a five carbon chain, making it a pento, five pentobarbitone. Thiopentone differs only in, uh, on the 
on the two position having a sulfur, a sodium and a sulfur group, which extends its uh, action. So it's an ultra short acting thiobarbiturate. It's a hypnotic, so it simply puts people to sleep. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't relieve pain and it doesn't relax them particularly. Now, this wasn't understood well. And unfortunately, at Pearl Harbor, um, as the casualties were coming into the sick bay at Pearl Harbor um, medical unit, they were all given thiopentone and they all died. And it's estimated the American Navy killed probably more people than the Japanese did by inadvertently overdosing patients with thiopentone. You must use it very, very carefully where there is shock because it will drop the blood pressure. Um, has, it is limited insofar as you can only really give it as a one-off shot because it redistributes throughout the body um, and you have an increase of volume of distribution but not enough to, to render you unconscious. And the more you give, the more it dis distributes throughout the body and the longer it lasts. Um, and it can be a, a big problem. Now then, the other character, also at the um, Mayo Clinic, was Ralph Waters, 1935. He was actually the first to use thiopentone to induce hypnosis, but he also introduced another anesthetic gas called cyclopropane. This is a colorless gas, is highly um, effective, it's highly potent. It's got a characteristic sort of sweet odor, rather like talcum powder. It's highly inflammable, explosive in air. Um, so it's, it gives you some idea, it's explosive in air between two and a half and 10%, and oxygen at um, two and a half to 60%. Comes in a little orange cylinder and um, the beauty of it is you don't you can give a lot of oxygen with it so you can just give a very small amount i think eight percent was the maximum you needed to give and as i say it was a very potent anesthetic so you could give high levels of oxygen and this facilitated early thoracic surgery so people would get into the chest without the patient having, having a collapsed lung without you know uh, without the other lung so the other lung could still provide enough oxygen so it's very useful. And he also introduced the to and fro circuit with soda lime, which assisted ventilation and you, you could recycle anesthetic gases, very useful. Now, um, in the United Kingdom, what happened? Um, well, uh, character here, Sir Ivan McGill, who was a very eminent anaesthetist at the Westminster Hospital, introduced the idea of endotracheal intubation. And you can see below his picture there, there are the um, tubes, it was basically his garden garden hose, which he adapted. He was a Northern Irishman with a very um, um, very good um, spirit of uh, character of, of improvisation. So he would measure the distance from the earlobe to the corner of the mouth, double it, cut a piece of garden hose that length, get a, an emery board and chamfer the end so that it was tapered. Uh, get the patient to sleep, as you see on the right there, usually with nitrous oxide and ether, and then would pass one of these tubes down through the nose and into the windpipe. Um, this could be facilitated with the McGill-Laryngoscope, so it's a bit like a shoehorn with a light halfway down it, or the McGill forceps. So a lot of McGill things that uh, you come to know about uh, as an anaesthetist. Um, the other interesting chap was um, this chap, Robert Mack who was a New Zealander who came across to Oxford in the 1930s as a general practitioner and um, he used to play golf with a, a garage mechanic called Robert uh, um, um, oh, Morris, Robert Morris, that's right. So Robert Morris and Robert McIntosh were great pals. Um, so uh, living in Oxford, anyway, one day Macintosh got a, a, a telegram from a, a friend of his who was a plastic surgeon who was working in the, signed up to sort of go off to the Spanish Civil War. And he said, can you come out and give me a hand because it's desperate here. I can't operate on people's heads and necks. So all the anaesthetics were given by nuns who were using shimmel bush masks, as I mentioned, and they won't let me anywhere near the face. Can you bring some of those McGill tubes with you, which he did. The problem and a tin of a big tin of treacle which was empty 
full of cotton wool, two holes punched in it for his ether vaporizer. And he found that working in Spain, either the ether vaporized to nothing in no time at all in the heat, or it, if it was a bit colder, it vaporized. And of course, the, the residue became colder and colder and colder until it didn't vaporize at all. And the patient started to wake up. So he thought long and hard about how he could overcome this. So what he really needed was a temperature compensating vaporizer. And he worked in Oxford when he came back with a German Jewish uh, physical chemist called Epstein, who got a job as escaped the Nazis and got a job as a lab technician in Oxford. They worked together and Epstein came up with the idea of using calcium chloride crystals, which would, um, as the ether vaporized, uh, the calcium chloride would give up its water crystallization and you would get it would heat up. So the two would balance each other out. They'd have a jacket of hot water on the outside, and that was it. And there was the Epstein Macintosh Oxford, or the ether, the emo, um, as it is today. Now, production was a problem. The war was about to break out. Um, so he went to his friend Morris and said, do you think you can knock some of these up in your little garage in Cowley? Uh, which he did. But they all look remarkably like an ox, like a, um, like a Morris 7, <laughs> with things like radiator caps. and, uh, and it, what looks suspiciously like an indicator arm as the as the dial gauge and then the Macintosh Loringa skirt which is used universally today anyway Macintosh became the um later became the first professor Nuffield professor of anesthetics at Oxford University and I had the pleasure once to actually meet him in a library World War II came so what did they learn from World War II well a better understanding of hypovolemic shock that's blood loss and what to do, how to treat it with blood, plasma, of a very eminent anaesthetist, again from the Westminster Hospital, um, Dr. Cyril Skur, who had the privilege of anaesthetizing King George VI in Buckingham Palace when he had his lung removed for lung cancer. And this is a verbatim, I'll read it out because it's actually quite informative. He said, we had pentothel, ether, we had Oxford vaporizers, thing I just mentioned, we had a field service patent bore machine, which was capable of giving gas, oxygen and ether, and we had spinals. We had a very poor selection of local anaesthetics. The Army Medical Corps was very bad at that. And of course, the relaxants didn't come in until really after the war. We, we didn't have relaxants at any time during at all during the war. I was working on battle casualties until 1945. With hindsight, if we'd had curare and so on, it would have been much better than having to give deep ether anesthesia for abdominal procedures. On the other hand, it's interesting to look at the medical history of the war and to see that in our theatre of war, at any rate, in Italy and North Africa, once abdominal wounds reached us, the field surgical unit or casual clearing station, practically none of them died. I think we got most, almost 100% survivors that killed. I think it's very informative. But he mentions muscle relaxants. Well, during the war, oh, sorry, that's, that's he mentions the Boyle's machine. The Boyle's machine has been developed. And this is sort of something I would have recognized as when I first started my anesthetic career. These are the sort of machines we had, basically a trolley with cylinders on it, flow meter on the back bar, as you can see. Let me get the spotlight. Let me get my spotlight. Oh, there it is. There's a back. There's a back bar there with flow meters. There's a um, vaporizer for either chloroform or trichloroethylene, and a vaporizer for ether, a coxeter vaporizer. And the tube coming down here into this gadget, which is a soda line absorber, and the to and fro system with a mask there, so the patient could breathe and rebreathe. So that way, so reducing pollution, um, but also um, recycling the gases and making things a little bit uh, um, less expensive, really. Okay, so muscle relaxants. I'm out of muscle relaxants now. That's tubo carari in the middle there. Um, again, um, get my little dot. Oops, oh dear. Right, I don't want to do that. Spotlight. There it is. Um, the important thing about this molecule, it's a huge, great chunking molecule. It's a biisoquinoline molecule. It's these two sodium 
um, sorry, I aiming groups here and here. They're the ones that work, that do the, the, do the job. They block the muscle end plate. So the nerve to a muscle conducts an impulse. At the end of the nerve, there's a gap and a substance called acetylcholine whips across the gap at a rate of knots and depolarizes the muscle end plate. Well, this stuff just comes along into the gap and it blocks the end plate. So stopping the acetylcholine getting there resulting in a flaccid paralysis. It comes from the plant Chondrodendrum tomentosum, grown in the Amazon. And it was anthropologists in the 1930s that discovered this tribe who were very fond of harvesting this stuff, making a sort of a, a thick soup out of it, dipping their arrows in and then going off and killing each other um, very effectively. Uh, so they thought, well, how did this work? And a man called Griffiths in Canada published a paper in 1943 on the use of d tuber curare, curare as it became known, to as a surgical adjunct to give profound relaxation during surgery. Well, that was in Canada. Um, these two chaps were interesting. Jack Halton was a complete, was a real maverick. He was the only fully paid anaesthetist in the Merseyside area, and he refused point blank ever to remove his bowler hat or boots in the operating theatre. Um, he liked to drink and it came to his attention that the United States Air Force Base in Wrightington near Warrington had the biggest and best stocked bar in the north of England. Um, he applied for and was successful in becoming the medical officer for that base and he and his pal uh, Cecil Gray used to go up there and drink. Um, Cecil Gray was a general practitioner in Liverpool who took an interest in anaesthesia and he was one, really one of Halton's protégés. So um, Halton basically taught him everything he knew about anaesthetics and he was very good. But Gray was slightly more uh, cerebral and a little bit more um, academic and came across the paper from Griffiths in Canada. Um, so how to get curare from Canada to the UK? Hmm, well, they did manage to persuade some B-52 pilots to smuggle it in from Canada, totally illegally. And they experimented on patients completely illegally in Liverpool. Um, they had no idea how much the stuff works. So they just simply poured the powder into a litre bottle or half a pint bottle of, say, of saline, infused it into the patient until they got an effect. Great. So he then wrote a paper, a seminal paper in 1946, a milestone in anaesthesia, D. tuber curare, in the proceedings of the Society of uh, Medicine, and described a whole anaesthetic technique called, it became known as the Liverpool Technique. He was then made professor of uh, anaesthesia in Liverpool, and uh, Jack Holton went into retiring the Isle of Man. End of that story. So then we have the, after the war, great discoveries. Great things happened, largely as a result, I think, of wartime research. Um, Lignocaine was first was the first uh, amide anaesthetic. I mentioned local anaesthetics before, and they are all um, benzoic. They're all esters. Um, you can see here. Get my little pen back again. Spotlight. Uh, um, there's the ester of amethacane in this case. So that's the ester bond binding the two parts of the molecule. Here we've got an amide bond, Let's see, which is very good. It, uh, it was a, a, a Scandinavian um, uh, discovery by Lufgren and Lundqvist, and first used by the great Torsten Gord in the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm in 1948. It revolutionized local anesthesia because of its safety. It has a pKa of 7.86. Now pKa is that pH at which 50% of the solution is ionized. And this is terribly important for local anesthetics because they have to do one of two things. They have to, in the ionized state, they have to cross the membrane, but they can only work in the unionized state once they're in the, in the nerve itself. So having something very close to a normal pH is probably ideal, really. 
um, pH, no, blood pH being 7.42. So lignocaine, big difference. And then a, 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 an interesting muscle relaxant, which works in a totally different way than um, curare. It's a depolarizing muscle relaxant called succinothonium was introduced in 1951. Beauty of succinothonium is that it works within 15 seconds or so, whereas through curare it takes three or four minutes. Um, has a very short, on, very rapid onset, as I say, and a very short duration of, act, of action. So it's ideal if, say, somebody's got a full stomach, you can give them succinothonium and get the tube down, protect the airway. Um, so in rapid sequence induction. What it is, simply, it's two acetylcholine molecules joined together, which is very clever, because uh, it relies on a different enzyme, an enzyme called pseudocholinesterase, to break down the dimer of acetylcholine. So that takes several minutes to work. So the succinothonium basically mimics acetylcholine. It hops, it's, it's injected, it goes into the muscle end plate, into the gap, the myoneural junction, hits the muscle end plate, depolarizes it, and then blocks it because it can't be broken down by the normal enzyme for acetylcholine, which is acetylcholinesterase. So it relies on this pseudocholinesterase to come along and break it down, and then it's broken down by the two, the two acetylcholine groups broken down. So a very interesting drug and still greatly used today. And then thirdly, this is a um, man called Suckling, beavering away in Alderley Edge in the ICI laboratories in 1951, came up with halothane, which was simply an ethane, it's trifluorochlorobromoethane. Very simple molecule, but it's like 2489 of a sequence. Um, this came about as a result of a man called E. May Bixby in um, Western Reserve University, who did a lot of work on fluorine following um, his work during the war, and as I mentioned, sort of a research from the war, on the Manhattan Project and the use of fluorine in the atom bomb. So E. May Bixby was a leading authority on this and made spent his whole life researching fluorine. And there seems to be something about fluorine which alters the solubility of um, substances and makes some better anaesthetics in this case. First used at the Manchester Royal Infirmary by a man called Johnson, 56, but it totally displaced um, ether, chloroform, trichloroethylene, ethyl chloride. They all just went and halothane was the stuff. ICI were producing this and the export um, fees, the export funds we were getting to this country was greater than our export uh, tariffs on Scotch whiskey. So highly successful, great British product. But there were problems as well. 1952, great polio epidemic broke out. 2,700 mainly young patients uh, presented with bulb of polio uh, to a hospital in Copenhagen, you and I. Um, but there's a 90% mortality. Uh, Larson was the director of the hospital and was very concerned, as you might imagine. And he, he approached an anaesthetist called Ibsen and said, well, how are we going to deal with this? Because the iron lung's not working. So Ibsen said, well, in theatre, we use endotracheal intubation. And uh, he said, well, how, how, are we, how are we going to do that then? Um, he said, well, the best thing is to do a tracheotomy, put a tube in so the patient can be awake and... Um, we don't have ventilators, we've got medical students. So the medical students all did eight hour shifts, including breaks for smokes. So they go out to have a smoke, as such as the, the morals of the, of the, of the time. Um, and they basically squeezed the bag for eight hours at a time and kept these patients alive. Um, as a result of this, pulmonary physiology underwent a total rewrite um, by an American physiologist called Comro. And chemical uh, pathologist called Astrup from uh, Copenhagen, who was the chemical pathologist in this hospital. And a new understanding was, was gathered of, was, 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 was reached on respiratory alkalosis and acidosis and respiratory failure and the importance of taking arterial blood samples to work out the tension of oxygen and carbon dioxide as well as the bicarbonate levels. Um, 
Ibsen was very reluctant to leave his operating theatre. He was very reluctant to go to any meetings about this. He was a very quiet, retiring man, like most anaesthetists are. And um, he was the first one to move from the operating theatre to the intensive care medicine. A little bit, to me, uh, to my mind, it's a little bit like the time when fish left the sea and came on land. <laughs> anyway, um, they set up a separate unit for what they call positive pressure ventilation and blood gas, I mentioned the arterial puncture, monitoring and the use of muscle relaxants and sedation. They found that as well as patients with bulbar polio, they could treat other patients and patients who'd had major surgery who weren't very well afterwards, patients who had been in road accidents. Um, and the idea of the intensive care unit was born, very relevant to today, of course. Um, and then disaster, another disaster in this country, in Chesterfield, of all places, two patients, Mr. Woolley and Mr. Rowe, undergoing two simple operations. One was a hernia, I don't know what the other one was, both under spinal anaesthetic. They both suffered severe pain on injection of the local anaesthetic, which is, which is surprisingly very unusual, and um, paralysis, which didn't recover. Um, this stopped the practice, there was a huge law court, law case, and uh, the um, health authority were found guilty, or they pleaded guilty, and uh, there was a huge payout. It stopped the practice of spinal anaesthesia overnight. The cause was thought to be contaminated ampules, glass ampules containing, in this case, a methacane. Um, and that was the thought. But later, it's now been shown in actual fact it wasn't that at all. It was the fact that the needles and the um, ampules were all sterilized in phenol, and phenol had contaminated mainly the needles. So they were injecting phenol, which is highly, highly toxic. Um, will kill anything or on touch. So, um, so there were no spinals really from the 1950s up to really mid 1970s when somebody was brave enough to review the whole business of spinal anesthesia and the use of lignocaine, of course, and the advent of another amide anesthetic, which was very long acting, called bupivacaine, which is used today more exclusively. So if you go to hospital and have a hip replacement or a knee replacement and you have a spinal anesthetic, which you probably will do, or almost certainly, you will have bupivacaine. Um, so there we are. So better understanding of regional anaesthesia and um, things like epidurals and spinals and better sterilizing techniques, better and disposable needles, of course, better engineered needles. They're now pencil points. They're totally atraumatic, they don't cause any. So the last 60 years, what's happened? Well, College of Anaesthetists was founded in the 1930s, gained the Royal Charter. Formal examination started, so now we're all fellows of the Faculty of Anaesthetists, we're all fellows of the Royal College of Anaesthetists um, now, um, which you have three sets of examinations over an eight year period. Research is encouraged and endorsed by the college. Training posts are linked to university departments, so every registrar is attached to a university hospital. Um, huge expansion in surgery with specialised surgery like cardiac, neuro, and paediatric surgery becoming more and more adventurous and more and more uh, exploratory, um, especially cardiopulmonary bypass, which was developed in the 1960s uh, with work mainly done in South Africa and America. We have a better understanding of physiology, generally, of the patient's cardiovascular and respiratory physiology. So intensive care units, have been developed in really every general hospital in the country. They almost exclusively are run by anaesthetists, although other specialities are coming into it more and more these days. And certainly over half of my training was actually in intensive care medicine. So I spent probably most of my all call time as a junior doctor in intensive care medicine. We've now got better muscle relaxants. I have used curare in the past and it's very good, but it's a bit unpredictable. Um, We've now got uh, amino steroids like pancuronium and vecuronium, as well as atracurium, which is an, another biisoquinoline. Um, and there are two rival teams, really. There's the Liverpool 
Lott, who on the Bi-Iso Quinlan School, and here at Watt University, who um, are producing amino steroids. Um, in theatres, there's a trend towards intensive care. So we're treating patients in intensive care, they're being treated, in theatre rather, they're being treated as if they're in intensive care. And of course, we bring our theatre skills, our needle access skills, our airway skills into the intensive care unit. So it's a two way street. Um, this is making IT uh, theatres much uh, safer, more sophisticated machines. Every patient now has a three lead ECG, um, little plug on your finger, little peg on the finger to measure your oxygen levels, a cuff on the arm measuring your blood pressure in five minutes, as well as measuring what's going in and what's coming out from your breath. And hopefully one day we'll have cardiac, proper cardiac output estimation. We have different drugs now. We've got uh, sort of mind altering drugs like um, droperidol and uh, phenothiazines, fentanyl, a very potent um, not, uh, uh, um, opioid, uh, which is a sort of a byproduct, second cousin twice removed from pethidine. Um, and ketamine, of course, which we do use from time to time, which creates psychosomatic dissociation. Interesting drug. Our inhalation agents are now better. All notice they've all got fluorine in them. Um, some of them have come and gone. Enfluorine's come and gone. Isofluorine seems to be are still hanging around. But the MAC, uh, can I just mention MAC for a minute? So I'm very conscious of time. Um, MAC, minimum alveolar concentration. How do you compare one anesthetic agent with another in terms of its potency? Well, you've got the lipid solubility given there, but MAC was a great idea. It was the, 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 the MAC, the minimum alveolar concentration is that concentration of the anesthetic required to prevent 50% of patients or volunteers moving in response to a standard six inch surgical incision. Hmm, I don't know which 50% I'd rather be in. So how do you get people to volunteer for a thing like that? Well, what you do is you pay medical students and Ed Eager IV, uh, who was professor of anesthesiology in University College of Los Angeles, was paying medical students. Um, like a man with three hands and these guys were coming along and he was testing different anesthetics and finding out what the MAC was. But the MAC is a very useful figure because it gives you an index of how um, potent an agent is. And you can see there, desferrane is not terribly potent. Well, you need 6.6%. You need a high concentration before you get decent anesthesia. These days, the, the, the drug of choice really is sevoflurane, the one on the bottom, which you can see bristles with fluorine um, molecules. They're all methyl ethers. non depolarized muscle relax, as I've already mentioned, I don't really dwell on that too long, but it gives you some idea. That's an amino steroid, vecuronium. And again, the amine groups, where are they? There's one. Uh, you can't see, can you? Uh, um, spotlight. There's one there, and there's the other one. And again, there, there that's apsocurium, which is the bias of quinoline. So you can compare them, there's a steroid molecule. And again, mevacurium, um, that's a bias of quinoline. So two bias of quinolines and a steroid. So there we are, those are the two amine groups, which is do the work. And the gap between them is clearly critical. Um, modern anesthesia, yeah. Two great things have happened um, in the last 40 years. Phenol, I mentioned, phenol's lethal. Phenol, we use it, it's, it's used to ablate nerves. You will literally inject it into a nerve and kill it in chronic pain conditions. The Nazis used to inject it intravenously to people they particularly did not like. They had the added advantage of embalming their victim on the on, on lethal injection. So toxic stuff. Propofol, which is used now universally, is 2,6-diisopropyl phenol. So what you do is two propyl groups, one on each side of the benzene ring, and you've got something which is literally as safe as mother's milk. Uh, incredible. 
So that was probably the greatest development in the last 50 years. So it, su it superseded thiopentone, pentothal, and other barbiturates. It's a non-barbiturate, it's a hindered phenol. And we actually know how it works, unlike most other studies. It works by, in, by um, activating GABA receptors, which are inhibitory. So the other thing that came in was um, the laryngeal mask. I was very fortunate to work in Northwick Park Hospital as a senior house officer. And I started with Dr. Archie Brain, among others. So I knew quite well. I saw him last time I saw him was at Heathrow Airport, where he was uh, heading off for um, Mauritius, explaining that his factory, where they make the laryngeal masks airways, is now situated in Mauritius. And he has to live above the shop, sadly. Somebody has to do it, he said, looking very sun-turned. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, it's an inflatable cuff that fits the contours of the oropharynx. And by inflating air into it, creates a seal. Uh, it's very clever because you don't need to paralyze the patient to get a tube through the, or take, to, to take a very, very deep anesthesia to pass a tube through their cords, the vocal cords. Um, and it basically means that your hands are free of having to hold a mask on. Plus, you um, you can operate on the face and even the mouth with one of these things in place. And they're used pretty well um, universally now. Um, every, well, every anaesthetic virtually has one of these. You, that's what you'll have. Um, and so the gas passes the gases pass in and out, up and down the tube through what's called a gothic window, which is situated just above the epiglottis and you can breathe in and out quite freely. Um, the beauty of it is propofol um, uh, depresses the airway sufficiently if you be able to put one of these things in very easily. Modern anesthesia, there we are, that was 1995, you can call it modern I suppose. If you can see there's the Boyle's machine, there's me as a registrar, uh, unusually anesthetizing uh, somebody for a very major operation having a bowel resection. And I'm just checking there to see what how how relaxed they are with a nerve stimulator, so two wires connected on the nerve. Quite clearly they're twitch, so we need some more muscle relaxants, which I'm there drawing up um, while having a bit of a joke with the surgeon. But you can see there the the machine is very much like the original Boyle's machine. There's the back bar with the flow meters, um, oxygen, nitrous oxide. Um, cyclopropane still, and uh, air. There's the vaporizer, which in this case was an isofluorine vaporizer. The back bar going down here to the circle absorber and a fluid logic ventilator pumping the anesthetic gases down through this tubing to the patient up there. There's the patient's head. Um, but you see the preponderance of monitoring, all these wires coming out everywhere and they're all to do with monitoring the patient. Um, so today's anesthesia, if you walk into an operating theatre today, that's what would confront you, a little bit like the uh, cockpit of a 747 really, but it's mainly monitoring, um, which really takes its more or less to the future. So the emphasis, emphasis today is all on physiological parameters, the blood pressure, the heart rate, the breathing rate, the oxygen levels, all these kind of things. Um, simplified, simplified choice of agents, rather like in the very early days, oxygen, air, nitrous oxide. Few people actually, interestingly enough, use nitrous oxide these days. Um, Sevofluorane, um, isofluorane or desfluorane. Very sophisticated ventilation system. Um, so quite sophisticated. There's the ventilator there. It's what's called a bag in a bottle. Um, there. bellows inside. That's the back bar, again, flow meters um, there. And those are the, the uh, vaporizers, so it's sevofluorine, isofluorine. Just the choices now are air, oxygen, and nitrous oxide on the back bar. Um, but all these are to do with monitoring the patient. That's a, a warmer. Um, hmm. There we are. So the future. Well, patient safety is the big one. 
always primary consideration, but in the future there will be more invasive monitoring of physiological parameters, so more, probably more needles being put in people. Um, ventilation has become very sophisticated and just basically a pump going up and down, particularly in intensive care, um, now with the COVID uh, problems uh, being put through their paces. Um, BiPAP is um, double uh, positive airway pressure. So you vary the level of the airway pressure during the respiratory cycle. A bypass, so there's, there's air flowing all the time. And as the patient is weaning on the ventilator, they can take a breath and it's augmented. So they get an extra burst of pressure. Um, on demand ventilation is the thing now. So patients are not very often vent uh, paralyzed in intensive care. They're allowed to breathe on their own or assisted breathing and flow by, which is very much like bypass. Uh, cardiac output measurements. This is the great evasive holy grail. If anybody can find a non-invasive, reliable technique for accurately measuring cardiac output, they will make an absolute fortune. Um, it's very difficult to measure it. It's usually a surrogate figure from um, all sorts of other parameters that are measured like venous pressure, venous return, or even pulmonary artery wedge pressure. Biofeedback mechanisms using AI will undoubtedly run the anaesthetic in the future. So anaesthetists will become largely redundant, I should think. Um, there'll be servo mechanisms to give drugs, which will decrease the amount of anaesthetic actually given, which is a good thing. Um, the drugs are getting pretty, pretty good now. They're fast in and fast out. So people sort of say, oh, I felt ill after an operation three weeks later they're lying to that well they're not lying they're, it's not the anesthetic it's uh, the anesthetic is out of your system within 12 hours um, totally um, so ideal vapors uh, high you know high mac pleasant to breathe fast onset offset doesn't cause nausea non-explosive and non-toxic the ideal induction agent pretty well propofol is pretty well there actually it's really got it part of the fact it's a bit sore on injection sometimes um, and don't wake up with a hangover, which is great. The ideal muscle relaxant, fast onset, fast offset, doesn't really system in and easy to reverse. You can reverse them by giving an anticholinesterase drug. And the ideal local anesthetic, of course, non-toxic primarily, but safe near nerves, um, pencil point needles and epidural kits pre-sterilized. And the ideal anesthetist, well, possibly a robot, who knows? All very well and good until the lights go out. Hmm. What happens then? So you don't have any of this uh, sophisticated stuff. Third world may give us a solution. Um, this is apparatus that will run, give an anaesthetic without cylinders, no electricity, has an oxygen concentrator, which is run off a battery, solar power, or even a man on a bicycle outside pedaling like fury to drive a generator. This is a suitcase version of a drawer over. So there you can just simply see the um, vaporizer. There's a rebreathing bag. There's a non-return valve. Um, the patient breathes, I'm trying to make sure it goes out that way. So there's the tubing, there's bag is put on the end there, but normally there'd be a patient on the end. And you can give added oxygen, but if you give just two liters a minute into this, you get a 40% um, oxygen concentration in the system. So it's very efficient. It comes in a suitcase. Uh, this is the more sophisticated version. This is the, uh, um, what it's called now. Uh, but this is the, um, the, more like a Bohr's machine, and it has a ventilator on there. Um, and very, very, very good. There we are. And they go by the name of the Gloucester Vents. So the Gloucester Vent Portable and the Gloucester Vent Helix after the ventilator. Why Gloucester Vent? Well, they were designed and conceived by my colleague, Dr. Roger Eltringham, who is a most incredible man. He spent most of his life alleviating pain throughout the third world and has invented the Gloucester Vent and put Gloucester on the map. Um, anybody deserves a knighthood he does now retired um, I actually borrowed 
the Gloucester event portable suitcase off him and took it to Nepal when I worked with Robin Youngs, uh, an ENT surgeon from Cheltenham. And we went out to this uh, remote place in Nepal and uh, I, um, I used the Gloucester vent. So um, we had no uh, oxygen, we had one cylinder of oxygen. Intermittent electricity supply, which was on and off most of the day, no drugs apart from what we brought from the United Kingdom. And then in 10 days, I anesthetized 17 adult and child patients without any undue incident for major ear surgery at an ear camp, each op lasting from 20 minutes to three hours. So thank you, Roger. And that's the end of my talk. Whew, right. Is anybody still there?